This is going to be a study about the false teacher and false doctrine prayer list. Because false teachers are sinners too with souls and they need prayers. And there are also false teachers who are your brothers in Christ. And you see a lot of uh, videos on here where someone is exposing someone and they're they're very mean and nasty towards that person. It's almost like they hate the person. But I mean, a false teacher is a person with a soul just like everyone else. But 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Notice it says for all men. That would include the people you don't like the Christians you don't like, the false teachers you don't like, and everyone else. And if you give supplications, then you are just making a request to God about something. And if you pray an intercessory prayer, then you're asking on behalf of someone else. And Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So, make a request to God that he will get the certain false teacher out of his false doctrine. Make a request that he change the man's attitude. Make a request that he'll help the man quit his sin and live for God. But back to verse 1, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Notice it says giving of thanks. And there are <coughs> there are a lot of Bible believers doing things that I don't agree with, but thank God they are doing something. They could just be like everyone else and do nothing. At least be thankful for the fact that they are trying to get the gospel out in some way, even if you don't agree necessarily with how they're doing it. Just be glad they're willing to do something for God. Even if he is teaching a few minor things wrong, he is still doing more than the man who is doing nothing. I don't understand people that got more patience for people who do absolutely nothing, who don't even act like a Christian, they got more patience for them than they do someone who's out giving the gospel, but yet they disagree with him on a few things. But verse 1 again says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So for kings and those that are in authority, you need to pray for the president, even if you despise him. You need to pray for all them that are in authority, your pastor, your supervisor at work. And that's what I want is a quiet and peaceable life. We have, we have it made right now in this country. We have freedom to worship and live in a... Uh, as much godliness and honesty as we want for the most part. I know there's a lot of wicked things going on, but I can carry my Bible where I want to. I can pray where I want to. And if we don't pray for those in authority, those things could be taken away from us. Now verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And I want to be pleasing in His sight, in the sight of Jesus Christ who is called God in verse 3. And right here, this is where we will begin the false doctrine prayer list. And number one, pray for the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims, the Christ-rejecting Jews, and all other religions who do not believe that Jesus is God. Because if these people don't get the true gospel, then they're going to go to hell. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, then you don't believe in a Savior who's 
sacrifice was sufficient to pay for your sins, you're lost. You, ha you can't reject the fact that Jesus is God. What good is it going to do to call them stupid or an idiot or something like that? Have a heart for somebody that hasn't come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible is clear that Jesus is God. And I can mention it over and over again. I was witnessing to a drunk and I told him that Jesus is God. And he said, no, no, he's not God. He's just his son. He just didn't understand that if Jesus is God's son, then that makes him equal with God. But the Bible is so clear on this matter in 1 Timothy 3.16 it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. And then in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So pray for these deity of Christ rejectors they need God they need to realize Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and that he purchased us with his own blood when he died on the cross now back to first Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 it says for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth and that brings me to the next false doctrine false teachers is pray for the calvinists paul said here that god will have all men to be saved now this doesn't mean that every man will be saved it just means that it's god's will that all men be saved he wants everybody to get in he wants everybody go to, to go to heaven he doesn't want anyone in hell who doesn't have to be there and thank god nobody has to go to hell that's the only thing good about hell is nobody has to go Second Peter 3 9 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but as long suffering to us we're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance so he wants all to come to repentance that is he wants all men to quit relying on their own goodness to get them to heaven come to him as a sinner and believe on him and this opportunity is out there for every man who's still breathing whether he be a fornicator an idolater, a liar, a pedophile, or a sodomite, or whatever other gross sin that he may be. Uh, John 12, 32 says, And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The moment you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior is the moment you have the opportunity to be saved, whether you're 5 or whether you're 95. From that moment until the time you die, you have the opportunity to believe the gospel, but putting it off is like walking on a tightrope over hell. You don't want to do that because tomorrow may never come. But you have the opportunity. God didn't choose for you not to be saved. He, he chose for you to be saved. The devil chooses for you not to be saved, and you just have to break the tie. If you say, I want to be saved, then you broke the tie, and you're going to be saved if you believe the gospel. Come to Jesus as a guilty sinner. But back to verse 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved? It's his will that all men be saved, but sometimes men don't do his will. They go against what he wants. Uh, he wants you to be saved, but you can, you can go against what God wants and die and go to hell who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. A lot of people have come to the knowledge of the truth when it comes to salvation, but they haven't on a lot of Bible doctrine. So they may teach things like Calvinism. I believe some Calvinists are saved. If they believe the gospel, then they're saved. And they're just teaching some wrong things. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.7 says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now that's someone who hasn't been saved. They haven't come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the professors and atheists and people who are so educated that they deny the simple gospel. They know so much but don't know the truth. They're ever learning 
and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then you have a lot of Christians who are smart and maybe even geniuses, but they don't understand the King James Bible is the Word of God. And a lot of Calvinists are great Bible students, but just can't grasp that they have free will. Or just can't grasp that they need to use the King James and not the ESV. You know, you can be saved and taught wrong. You can be saved and teach some heresy. But you need to willingly submit yourself to the truth of the Bible and the truth of the gospel. And how it's for every person. But number three, let's look at verse five. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now number three, we need to pray for the Catholics. You know why? Because the Catholics believe they have to confess their sins to a priest in a confessional booth, and that's a sad thing. Because this verse here said, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus is our mediator. He is our high priest. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If I need something, if I need to confess something, need to thank God for something, need to pray about something, give praise to God, then all I do is go to him myself. I don't need this other man over here to be able to get to Jesus Christ. I can call on God wherever I want to. If I'm at work by myself, working, I can call on him then. I can get to God without anybody else. So verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due times. Once again, the Calvinists missed it. Pray for the Calvinist, Because Jesus gave himself a ransom for all, not just a few. Because, the, you know, the Calvinists believe that Jesus died for a certain group of men who they call the elect but this verse says he gave himself a ransom for all that's everyone who's ever lived and we testify that he is god in the flesh who died for all men and he's going back in a rapture coming back in a rapture and coming back to set up his kingdom on earth at the second coming after the tribulation and he will rule in righteousness first timothy 2 7 says, Whereunto I am ordained a pastor and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So Paul was ordained. He was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher by God, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity means truth. He certainly was not a Catholic. He knew he could get straight to God. He certainly was not a Calvinist. He knew that Jesus died for all men. But number four, you need to pray for today's self-proclaimed apostles. Paul was an apostle. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, it says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Paul had these signs of an apostle, which it gives you in Mark 16, 17 through 18, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So Paul had these signs of an apostle. Paul got bit by a venomous snake in Acts 28, and it didn't even hurt him. He just slung it right back off. He could speak with tongues. He could send out handkerchiefs and heal people. He had the signs of an apostle. And people who are claiming to be apostles today are liars. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. You need to pray for these false apostles today. They are satanic ministers with false gospels and are accursed according to Galatians 1, 8 through 9. Pray they get saved 
and pray they quit leading others to hell. The charismatic movement has a bunch of damnable heresies. It's a cult based on false gifts. They love to exalt the flesh. <clears throat> they love to uh, do all these things outwardly in a church service to show that they are full of the quote gift of the Holy Ghost and to show that they have salvation through these outward what they call gifts. But First Timothy 2 8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now while the charismatics like to get wild in church and run around, this doesn't mean you can't get happy or lift up holy hands as Paul says to do here. He says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Number five, pray for the money-hungry women preachers. You know, them ones you see on TV, Paula White and Joyce Meyer. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 says, In like manner also that the women, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. The majority of selfies taken that you see on Facebook and Instagram by women do not have shamefacedness. It's wrong for a woman to try to look sexy. It's wrong. If you're trying to look sexy to <clears throat> impress men and get them to lust after you, that's a sin. It's wrong for a woman to try to flirt with her eyes and to seduce a person with their eyes. Proverbs 6, 24 through 25 says, To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. If she's doing that, she's not showing shamefacedness. Uh, many females like to do certain things with their lips in selfies. This isn't shamefacedness. When you're trying to look sexy with your face, that's not shamefacedness. She also should have sobriety, a sober mind. She shouldn't be given to wine or any drugs. As they say, if you can get a woman to drink, she'll do anything. Habakkuk 2.15 Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. The Bible is so up to date here in 2019. But now when you see these women preachers on TV, they don't go by these verses. They wear real tight skirts and many times <clears throat> look like harlots. Uh, the Bible lets us know that there are clothes a, a harlot wears. In Proverbs 7.10, it says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. But what does 1 Timothy 2 9 say? In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with boarded hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, there are a lot of women who won't wear makeup or jewelry, but they have a mouth that is the most unattractive, nasty thing on the planet. But 1 Peter 3 1 through 4 says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden men of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. Makeup isn't bad. Jewelry isn't bad. You just don't want. You just don't want to let that be your adorning, but let it be that hidden man of the heart. Now, verse ten. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Think about it like this. 
You may not wear modest clothes because you're trying to attract men, but you do attract men when you wear those clothes. Do you want your husband being attracted to all these other women who are wearing immodest clothes? So treat other women like you want to be treated. Don't wear these immodest clothes around their husband. 1 Timothy 2.11 Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Notice that sins of the mouth are very common in the Bible. There is nothing better than a godly woman, but there is nothing worse than a wicked woman. And I'd rather have a woman who dressed like a whore than a woman who has a mouth that will never shut always criticizes, always backbites and nags and complains and calls names and tells her husband to move out of the way and sows discord and yells and screams. And there are a lot of women who dress right, but they don't talk right. They don't honor their husband. They want him, they want him to be their helpmeet. When God plainly said that Eve was the helpmeet for Adam, it says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection your wife shouldn't be your pastor that's twisted but that's the day we're living in the girls want to be boys boys want to be girls they'll save a snake but kill a baby a woman should learn in silence there's something wrong with a man who will sit under a woman preacher and every woman preacher is automatically a rebel and stubborn and can't follow a very basic command in the Bible, which we've just read. And if she can't follow and believe a basic doctrine, such as the one we just read, then she's not got any business telling me to do anything. First Timothy 2.12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So out goes Joyce Meyer, Paula White, and all the others. Verse 13 and 14 says, For Adam first formed, Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The reason a woman shouldn't teach is because she is more likely to be deceived. When Adam ate the fruit, he didn't do it because he was deceived. He did it because he loved his wife. Verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So she shall be saved from deception. The context shows it's talking about deception, not salvation of the soul. But a woman is more likely to be deceived while childbearing because her body's going through all these changes. But if her husband leads her right as the spiritual leader, which that's the fault of most men, they're a bunch of lazy deadbeats, and they let the woman take up the uh, the spiritual leadership in the home because they're too lazy to read the Bible. The man's too lazy to lead his kids and teach them the Bible and to go to church and do all these other things that could lead his family down the right way. So the woman has to take up all these responsibility because the men are such deadbeats. What would help marriages and families is for the man to quit being such a lazy deadbeat and for the woman to shut up and keep quiet and learn in silence. I mean, sometimes she has to step up and be the spiritual leader. But if she's got a husband that's that's trying to lead the house spiritually, then she needs to shut up. And the man needs to quit being a lazy deadbeat all the time and selfish. But if they continue living right and staying away from drugs and alcohol and, and try to be as holy as they can and try to be honest and just abstain from as much sin as possible then it'll be like this verse said notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety but this is saved from deception not saved from hell because every time the bible says saved it doesn't necessarily mean saved from hell but this has been first timothy chapter 2 on false teachers and people that we need to pray for because false teachers have souls. False teachers are loved by God and we ought to pray for them. We need to teach against what they're teaching 
But we need to realize they have a soul and they are people too. Because people I've seen, they can get vicious with people who believe differently than them. But this has been First Timothy chapter 2.